Good morning. Oh, I feel so blessed to have Asher and Lindsay with us, and the music and the t- visitors and the time we've had so far has been so meaningful. And here we are um, now at the time when we get to go a little deeper in God's Word. How good and how rich this is. We're in a series right now in 1 Peter where we're thinking about what it means to live as aliens in this world. And just a, a little side note, there's a Bible study that accompanies this every Thursday night at 6 at Crown Hill Mennonite Church. It's a joint Bible study with five or four other Mennonite churches, and it starts with dinner at 6, and then the study goes until about 7.45. So if you want to go deeper with today's passage, I encourage you this Thursday to attend that. At this time, though, I'd like to invite you to take out your Bible or take out the Pew Bible even. If you want the Pew Bible, it's on page 1176 and 1177. And I want us just to refresh our memories again of the ground we've covered so far in our series. And that will take us up to this call today that we have to live as strangers and aliens. And it will give us a little bit more insight into maybe a deeper meaning uh, for our passage. So I want you, if you would, if you look in the, in the Pew Bible, um, on page 1176, you have the opening of 1 Peter, chapter 1. And we said before that this comes to us later in Peter's ministry, after he has years and years of experience, and he's writing to a church that's scattered all around the Mediterranean, and he addresses them at the beginning um, as God's chosen who are scattered out among uh, the nations in all these different regions. And so he recognizes that it's hard to be a scattered people, and throughout the book, he's going to try to speak to that. And that's why we see in our first major heading, um, in the Pew Bible, you see, praise to God for a living hope. Peter knows that it's hard to be a scattered people, to be strangers in this world. And so what helps us to get through this is the hope that we have in Jesus, this living hope. So that was our first week. We talked about what does that hope mean and how can that inspire us? And then you see the next major heading, uh, right above verse 13 in chapter 1, is be holy. And that was the huge snow day week when we had to cancel church. So we didn't get to do a sermon on that, but we, we, we actually connected it with the next week. But part of this interesting message about being scattered involves God's call to holiness, a certain special redemptive holiness that isn't just secluded from others, but is engaged with others and is contagious and goes out. And we were talking about that last week. Now, if you go into... Uh, Later in chapter 2, you can see there's this section right before verse 4 called the living stone in a chosen people. We talked about that last week. What does that mean that Jesus is our foundation? What does it mean that we're built upon him? We're God's chosen in as much as we're built on Jesus, right? We're, we're God's chosen as we abide in him. And we can be holy in as much as we remain in him. And we can reach out and bless other people's with his help. And so basically this morning, we're going to continue a little further down in the passage with this theme about being built upon Christ, seeking to be holy in this world while we're scattered people. And we're going to try to connect that with verses 11 and 12 that John read to you. What relationship should believers have with the world? What relationship should believers have with the world? We're going to try to answer that question this morning. It's a tricky one. We're called to be holy, but we're a scattered people living out uh, among our neighbors and friends out in the world every day. So what kind of relationship should we have? So I want to highlight the terms for us that are used in our passage of aliens and exiles and see if maybe if we go down this this trail more deeply with why Peter uses this this language, we'll understand how we can relate to the world in, in a healthy way. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. So Peter addresses us as aliens and exiles. Why does he do that? Why is that important? And I just want to highlight the first word, aliens. It's an interesting word. It can mean foreigner, aliens, parikos in Greek. And this word has to do with uh, privilege, relationship to power structures, you see here, it refers to people who reside in a given place without the legal protection and rights provided for citizens. Those are the, the pericos. 
And so Peter calls us a perikos in this passage. We're an alien. We, we don't have the normal relationship to the privilege and the power structures of this world that we inhabit. We have a different relationship to that, a different sense of, of what our privilege should be and, and how power relates to us and how we seek it. And the second thing, this term exile, sometimes translated stranger, paripidemos, that's a, that's a strange one to say. Can you say it with me, paripidemos? <laughs> yeah, that's an unusual one. It refers to people who reside in a place but who stay there only for a brief time. So there's a sense in which we relate differently to the power structures and the privileges of the world and also a sense in which we know our time here is limited. Our relationship to uh, how we put down our roots, how we live our lives is tied into a brief timeline. So we're going to have a different mentality when we think about what we invest in, won't we? So we're going to take these two words, aliens and exiles, and we're going to go on a little journey into the Old Testament because in the Greek version of the Old Testament, these words appear together in Abraham's story. We're going to look at Abraham's life of how he lived as an alien and an exile and what that can say about God, his plan of salvation, and about us and our call and how we relate to the world. So I want to take this really interesting story from Genesis 23. And once again, we have our two words here, stranger and alien. Uh, In the Greek version of the Old Testament, these are the same exact words from our passage today. And we're going to kind of get a sense of what Abraham's experience was like living this out, okay? This is a very unusual story. Um, Just a little bit of background. We know Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, and God called him to go to a foreign land, a strange land, a land of promise, that he didn't know, and to live among people who are not his people. And so he responded, yes, he was obedient. He went on that journey, and here he is in our passage today, living in Canaan, that strange land that the Lord called him to, that was part of that covenant he made with Abraham. And he has a very unique problem as he's in the land of Canaan. Uh, One of his wives has died. And how do you go about um, a funeral and burying your loved one in in a strange land? You don't know the, the places, the people, you're not established, and that's where we find him today. So let's hear the words from Genesis 23. Sarah died at Kiryat Arba, this is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham rose up from beside his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a stranger. I don't have the same relationship to power and privilege that you do here. And an alien, I haven't been here as long as you have residing among you. Give me property among you for a burying place so that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now, this is so interesting. Listen to the Hittites' response. The Hittites answered, Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you any burial ground for burying your dead. Now, do you see something interesting there? Abraham is a stranger in this land. He doesn't have the privileges that the local residents do, but they have seen his life. They know him. They've observed him, and they call him, with a title of great appreciation, a mighty prince, which is acknowledging they've seen his life. They've gotten a witness of who he is, and it's impacted them. And based on that witness, they are open So there's an interesting thing going on here that that God would call Abraham to be a stranger and that his life would be this witness to the local residents and somehow would draw them in and make them open. Let's hold that for a second in our minds and go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews that tries to unpack a little bit more for us what it meant for Abraham to be a stranger. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Once again, we see that word stranger is used. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home. He probably had to change some of his uh, expectations, right? Lindsay and Asher a few times when he was there, (laughs) just like you. Um, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Hmm. Let that sink in for a second. God is going to call us to go to places that are outside our comfort zone. And if we remember why Peter calls us strangers and exiles, he's reminding us that we're here just for a brief time. 
And maybe we should have more of the mentality of living in tents. I'm not speaking of literal tents here, but of a place that we know isn't our final permanent residence. We don't seek to put down our roots in such a way that ground our meaning and purpose and identity in the local building. But somehow we realize our final place of belonging is in the kingdom. All these people, Hebrews goes on to say, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, a a whole host of others that are named, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Wow. They saw from a distance, yet they still believed. And here we have the benefit of receiving the gift. Let's listen to Ephesians 2. You are no longer foreigners and strangers. We've, we've received the gifts, so now we have something new. We have something different. You are fellow citizens with God, God's people, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So yes, we do not have the same relationship to the power and privilege system of the world. Yes, we live in this life temporarily as sojourners. But at the same time, we are citizens of another land. At the same time, we are part of another household. And though at times it's hard to be aware of and remember, that is a tremendous source of hope, all because of Jesus, who our lives are built on. So I'm going to ask the question again. Let's see if we can get some more insight here. What relationship should believers have with the world? Maybe we're starting to think about our mentality, right? How we think about what we prioritize. But what about holiness? We're called to be holy people. We heard last week, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. But what kind of holiness are we called to? What does it mean to be this royal priesthood in the world? We're also a scattered people. Why are we chosen? We're chosen in Christ. Christ is chosen to serve, to bring healing and redemption to the nations. And as his people build upon him, being chosen means that we're called to serve. That the holiness we're called to is redemptive and contagious. It goes and spreads out in the world. It doesn't isolate itself from the world. Now let's think about witness here and what people observe of us how they encounter us. Remember Abraham's story, the the Hittites had such a witness of him that they were open. And when he needed, when he had a need, they were there and they were open to meeting him there. Let's think about our own witness. It says here in verse 12, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Gentiles can also be translated among the people of the nations, of all nations. So that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. So Peter's saying it's an assumption that we are going to be misunderstood. It's an assumption that sometimes when we're trying to live out our faith, we're going to be derided for it. We're going to be judged. We'll be mocked. But we have this hope in Christ. We have this deep sense of belonging and purpose in him. Don't let the hard times overcome us. Continue on the journey, and God will do powerful things, not only for you, but For others, they'll get a witness. They'll be drawn in, and perhaps they'll even become a part of this great kingdom family. I would like to uh, share this quote from Thomas Schreiner in his commentary on 1 Peter. He says, one of Peter's favorite words for expressing the new life of believers is conduct, anastrophe. In 115, it refers to the holiness of life required of Christians, and in 118, to the evil way of life from which they have been delivered by Christ's death. So we're called to a life of holiness, a holiness that draws us to engage with others, and a holiness that also quickens us to not fall into the old patterns of life that are tied in with the power structures of this world, the meaning and the purpose and the achievement status that the world says we need. Unbelievers viewed Christians with suspicion and hostility because the latter did not conform to their way of life. It's kind of a tricky thing. We're, we're not living according to the way of life, but yet we're still wanting to engage them. Peter enjoined believers to pursue virtue and goodness so that their goodness will be apparent to all in society. It's a really interesting call to holiness. We're scattered people engaged, living in the world, seeking to bless our neighbors, 
really living out the call to serve and love them, but yet somehow we're intentional and mindful of how we interact with the power structure and the value system of this world. Now, this is a very fascinating passage, and I I have to thank Jeremy Clevenger for this. This past week, we got together to talk about the journey program progress that he's making and, and discuss some questions, and he brought this passage from Jeremiah to talk about. And it's a fascinating passage, and I just want to share it as a way that encapsulates this call to holiness as a scattered people. It's fascinating. Now, the children of Israel, um, the southern tribes, went into exile in Babylon. um, And when they went, they weren't sure what they should do. And some of them didn't want to unpack their bags. They they just were so mindful of getting back to Jerusalem and to their, their home. And they weren't really sure what they should do in terms of ordinary life there in Babylon. And Jeremiah writes them a letter, and this is what he tells them. And this is so fascinating. Let's listen to this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for, for it, because it, if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now this is really important. We cannot, as strangers and aliens in this world, think that that means that we check out and we don't unpack our bags. God has set us into this place for a reason, to live our life engaged for the welfare of our community, of our city. He's put us here for a reason. So we should pray for the prosperity of our city. We should, we should actively work for the prosperity of our neighborhoods and our friends. We should seek for them to prosper because that's part of our mission. The call to holiness as a stranger is a call to be mindful of God, but engage in loving our neighbor. It's this call to redemptive holiness, a holiness that can be shared because of Christ. So what is our relationship to the world? It's one of mindfulness, avoiding the power structures and what they call us to that can obscure what Jesus calls us to. And it's also being willing to engage in love and serve. Which leaves us with one final question in my mind. As aliens, how should believers interact with other aliens? It's deeply embedded in the Old Testament, John mentioned it in his call to worship that God knew that his people were an alien people. He sent Abraham into Canaan. Eventually, the children of Israel end up in Egypt as foreigners, and he takes them out of the land of Egypt back to Canaan. They go into exile into Babylon, and then he brings them back. And at different times, they themselves are strangers and foreigners, and he tells them at various points that they should be kind and hospitable and caring towards the aliens and the strangers in their midst. And then we have these wonderful examples that John shared in the call to worship in the New Covenant of Jesus modeling this, so much so that even in Matthew 25, he says, when I was a stranger, when I was an alien, you showed kindness to me. Really driving home the point that God's heart is for people who are on the outside, people who don't have power, people who are marginalized. And somehow, because his people have walked this journey He also wants his people, us, the body of Christ, the church, to be especially mindful of others who are living this journey in different ways. And so I'd like to invite the ushers, if you would, uh, to pass out um, some papers to you. This um, salmon colored paper is something that um, the Ohio Conference is discerning right now. And basically... I'm passing this out to you this morning just so you'll be aware of this conversation, that this conversation is is currently going on in in our conference. And in March, um, our church, the delegates who will go uh, to attend the annual conference assembly from our church, as well as a number of other local churches, will vote as to whether or not we want to affirm uh, this resolution. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, Um, this resolution is an attempt to speak to our contemporary reality without being politicized or falling into any political language or political camps. It's an attempt to uh, draw from um, the call of Scripture 
for us to care for the aliens in our midst, for us to show hospitality. It's trying to to respond to that call in our contemporary world. And so I'd just like to highlight in in that front of that document, there's a section that says background. And in the second paragraph of that section, um, it says, we believe any discussion of immigration should include the, these truths. And it, and it lists four truths here, and I just want to mention them briefly so that we can be mindful of this as we think of how do we as aliens relate to other aliens, my, my question. So it says, human beings are created in the image of God. That's one core biblical truth going back to Genesis. All are, are, are worthy of value, dignity, and respect because they're made in the image of God. The second one, the biblical call to compassionate and just treatment of foreigners. I went ahead and put um, some of those scriptures up here real quickly so you could see, like in the book of Leviticus. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Wow. Deuteronomy 24 When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien. And it goes on in a number of other ways to say how the food, the extra food, should be left for the alien. Um, Let's look at the third thing here on the sheet. It says, the specific teachings of Jesus, that's referencing Matthew 25. You give water to the thirsty, you give food to the hungry, and you show kindness and hospitality to the alien, to the foreigner. And then the fourth thing is actually from Ephesians chapter 2, that the body of Christ, the the kingdom family that Jesus is is creating in our midst is worldwide, that it embraces people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And so when you bring these four truths together, we're all made in the image of God, the old covenant and the new call us to compassion and hospitality of foreigners, that Jesus himself modeled this, and that the nature of his kingdom family reflects the, uh, all the nations of the world, we say we need to speak to this contemporary situation with immigration. Not in any political way, we're letting the gospel and the scriptures speak to us as people of faith. Something that tr- transcends politics and transcends um, political groups and agendas. So the resolution itself, if you look um, on the lower part of the page, there's something that says congregational component. And I just want to show you the A, B, C of that. Um, A, it says to become better informed on immigration issues. If we believe um, the things that were read just a few seconds ago from Scripture, then as agents of God's kingdom, as strangers in this world, we need to become informed of immigration issues. Just learn more. Be aware. It would help us pray. Pray in a helpful way. Uh, B says to promote healthy dialogue in group settings. C is to pray for the Spirit's leading and seeking to minister to the needs of immigrants within our congregations and our communities. So we have the benefit in our context of um, being a, a partner with Open Arms Hispanic Ministries. That is a wonderful way for us to work at C. We've had joint worship services with Salem Mennonite before and have met a number of the folks who are involved over there. We had Geraldo Nunez come and speak at our Christmas Eve service. We know that they're doing good work This is an area of great potential for us to go deeper. On that front, I just want to point out one thing. Um, There is a a sheet that's on the back table as you walk out the door. You might want to check this out. Open Arms is sponsoring a mentorship program with their Hispanic youth. And if you're interested in becoming a mentor, it's one way that we can practically work at, at this in our context. Sheets are on the back. So the final thing I'll say about this form, and then I'll close our time. At the bottom, the, there is um, a proposal for some kind of statement that we as a conference or we as congregations some, could, could make, some kind of affirmation of the dignity and value of each individual and our concern for um, a just and fair uh, immigration system that is nonpartisan and nonpolitical. And so I humbly submit this to you to look over and to read. Um, please uh, pray and ask God, you know, is this something that we feel we can support as a congregation? And give um, feedback to either me 
Now, I'm not sure if all of us, all of our delegates will be there this year at ACA, but Beulah Steiner has historically been a delegate and gone to ACA. You could share with Beulah, or Steve Schmidt has been a delegate. He won't be there this year, but you can still share with him, and the three of us can talk. But just give us your feedback on if, if you think this is a helpful step. I think it's, it's, a, it's a time of urgency where it helps if the church can speak and give a witness to the world, and so this is one way to do that. So please pray about that as we seek to be aliens in this world who relate well and show hospitality and love to other aliens. We glorify God as aliens and strangers and how we think, live, and treat others. Can you read that with me? Will you join me with that? We glorify God as aliens and strangers in how we think, live, and treat others. That's really the crux of the matter, isn't it? We want to glorify God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we want to think, live, and treat others in a godly way. Love your neighbors yourself. That's That's the crux of the matter, isn't it? Will you join me in our closing prayer? Jesus, our Savior, with you we are on holy ground. Your love returns us to wholeness and right relationship. We thank you for the light of salvation. Together we pray for the saving of our world, for your wholeness within our congregation, within our family and friends, within the stranger and alien, and within ourselves.